All right, good morning. Uh, why don't we begin our worship this morning as we stand together and we sing a great hymn, number 62, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Yeah. 
deliverer, my deliverer. You know, Jesus, God, he, he delivers us from, from evil. He delivers us from our sin. He delivers us from a lot of different things if we let him. And as we sang that song, some of the words go into the fact that it says, you are my hiding place. And I kind of just was thinking about that a little bit last night. And, and looked up that verse, and it comes from Psalm 32, 7 that says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. And when you think of a hiding place, if you're hiding from something, right, you're looking for a place where you can kind of get away and where something or someone's not going to find you or harm you, right? And in that way, God and Christ is our hiding place. If we hide out in Him, if you will, if we go to Him and trust in Him, it doesn't mean that trouble isn't going to find us, because obviously in our lives, trouble always does find us in different ways. But what it really does mean is that God is there for us. He's always on our side, and we know if we're in Him and trusting in Him, that our lives are secure in Him, no matter what. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank You so much for the fact that You are our deliverer, but that You also are our hiding place, Lord, and that we can go to You and hide out in You, that You're secure, You give our lives security no matter what comes along, and that You love us no matter what, and that we can love You back. 
thank you, Lord, for being with us here today and as we continue to sing these songs to you. Just be honored and be glorified in all that we do here this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, good morning. Glad to see all your happy, smiling faces, and this time I'm not lying. I can actually see your happy, smiling faces. Um, because of my new spiffy glasses uh, that are progressive lenses, and so now I can, I can see far and near, both at the same time, uh, the miracle of modern technology. A couple of announcements here before we, we go to prayer. Uh, the first one is, of course, May 29th is Memorial Day. And, um, you know, I, I know that that's, that's often a time in which we take the opportunity to, you know, do some barbecuing. We celebrate sorting the beginning of uh, the summer months. But, um, but also, would you take that time to do what the day is set aside for, which is to remember uh, those who have given their life and service uh, to our country so that we can uh, enjoy those times uh, together. There are many people... Uh, in our family, uh, some that you have known and are very near and dear to you, and some that are very close members of your immediate family who have given their life in service uh, to our country. So on that day, um, would you uh, make sure and set aside some time, and we'll do something special here at church too, but I'm just kind of putting it on your radar screen. On May 31st, we will have a picnic for Awana, um, and we hope that you will um, feel free to attend that. And then coming up on the 6th, there's a ladies' brunch at Blondie's at 9.30 a.m. Uh, July 4th, of course, we will be participating in the Columbia uh, Parade. Um, and I don't know if we, do we have ideas already for the float? I'm sure that Dennis has probably already had his truck commandeered and his trailer absconded with. Um, and then June 18th will be Father's Day, so we hope that you'll come uh, then as well. And then, although it seems like uh, it is still far enough away... Um, that we don't need to talk about it. Nevertheless, June 31st through August 4th is Vacation Bible School, and that comes uh, sooner than you know it. And then on the 6th through the 12th, we'll be sending a kids, uh, some kids to Word of Life camp, and we encourage you to be in prayer for that. And if you'd like to give a donation to help, um, I'm sure that uh, they will take that. All right, let's go before the Lord and ask for right, his... Yes, things. yeah. We must pray for our... <clears throat> Yes. They are being kicked out to make room for mm -hmm. the immigrants over six and a half million that are coming to our country. Very, very good. Thank you for, for pointing out. And actually, during the prayer time, I'm going to leave sort of an open uh, part for anybody who wants to pray for something. So, uh, Paul, when, it, when that comes, why don't you pray for that? Because I think that would be great. Let's go before the Lord. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your grace and for your mercy. For every breath that you allow us to take in this world, Lord God, for it is a gift from you. For every step that you allow us to take as we enjoy a health or even a relative sense of health, for that is a blessing that comes from your very hand. For every beat of our heart, Lord God, we know is an opportunity for us to return to you the thanks that we are due because of your generosity to us, not only in this physical world, but also uh, by virtue of the fact that we can commune with you in the power of the Spirit. So Lord, as we come together on this day, and we do so routinely on the Lord's Day, to gather together to sing, to lift up one another in prayer, to engage in fellowship, to open this book, Lord God, your word, uh, Father, may we, we never grow so accustomed to the habit that we forget the privilege that we have in order to worship. And God, part of that worship you know is our lifting one another up in prayer. And we, we come before you asking for uh, just a few, knowing that there are many, many more, Lord, who stand behind each of the prayer requests that have been given to us and placed upon uh, the sheet of paper that constitutes our prayer list. But nevertheless, Lord God, we thank you that you tune our ears to both the spoken and silent prayers, knowing that you have heard them even before we have spoken them. So, Father, this morning we lift up Barbara Austin, and we pray that you'll be with her as she continues to care for and, and Jim. Lord God, would you be with them, draw close to them, and may your grace be known in a very powerful way for them. God, I pray for Judy York. Would you be with her, Lord God, as she continues to recover? Um, and Father is now in Wyndham Hospital. Lord God, would you just be with her? 
draw close to her and also to Howard. Father, we pray for Anne, who is in Hartford Hospital, recovering from a fall that now requires, I believe, her, her hip replacement to be uh, rebuilt or re-replaced. God, would you be with her and draw close to her and may your healing hand be upon her. Father in heaven, I pray that you will be with those who have lost loved ones in this, uh, this recent week, these recent two weeks. Father, I pray that you would be with all of those who mourn Herb Erico. I pray that you'd be with Lucille. God, that you'd be with Britain and York and their families. Father, that your comfort would fall upon them. Father, I pray the same for Jeff Rockefeller as he mourns the passing of his mother. God, would you be with his father and, and all of the family, Lord God, that they may know your peace in the midst of this time of trouble. And Father, there are probably many more, some that have spoken, some not so spoken. So God, I pray that in this moment now you would inspire the prayers of your people. So if you have a prayer request that you'd like to give a one or two sentence prayer for, would you, just where you are, if you're willing, just speak aloud your request to God. men and women that have been shortchanged once again and uh, have been kicked out of their dwellings, lack of better term, to make room for uh, people that don't and legally belong here. We ask you, Lord, to please be with them as they uh, deal with their uh, home loss and uh, that Many would go into uh, depression and further as a result. Please be with them and steer them towards a house of God, a true believer in Jesus that goes by the Bible. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. Dear Lord, I pray for Sandy and for this trip to the energy and touch and need. I thank you for all she did, things she does around the fellowship. And I pray you the help of the waters as well as. Amen. Father, the world in which we live, <clears throat> you know, um, is filled with turmoil. Uh, turmoil all around us, and one need only uh, listen to the news, Lord, you know, to hear um, how divided and how tumultuous our world is. In many ways, Lord God, it is easy for us to grow uh, so disillusioned with the darkness that we I do not see the light that, that dawns and shines brightly even in the midst of it. And I thank you especially for uh, the college graduates who uh, having uh, all had an experience with you knowing the truth are being sent out into the world. Lord God, I pray that you be with them. I think of Jonathan Caldwell, Alex Considine, Amanda Frame, Ariel Minor, Ruth Soderberg, and Ava Hassel as college graduates. Lord, would you go before them? Would you anoint them to do what you have called them to do in such a way, Lord God, that the light of your son Jesus Christ shines through them in whatever profession uh, that you have lead them to. And I think of the high school graduates, both uh, my son Toby and Micah Soderberg, Lord God, I pray that you would be with them. May you anoint their decisions and help them to make decisions about what the next step in their journey with you may be. Uh, but Father, all of this we pray <clears throat> because we can knowing that you hear us, knowing that we do not approach you as a distant God who is unwilling to hear the pleas of your people, but rather 
that we come before you as one who call you Abba Father, one who is drawn near to us so that we may draw near to you. And Father, may all that we do and that we say in these next few moments as we open your word be to your glory and we pray these things in Jesus' blessed name. And all God's people said, <clears throat> amen. So we have found ourselves in the middle of a sermon series on um, the Psalms or the wisdom literature. And so I, I, I started in the Psalms. I know that Dennis preached out of the Psalm last week. And, and we will continue to go look to the Psalms and other wisdom literature. But there's two things I want to point out before we jump headlong into the sermon this morning. The first one <clears throat> is it like I suggested a couple of weeks ago, at least while I'm preaching, one of the things I'd like to do is to to approach the Psalms from a uniquely Christological standpoint. And what I mean by that is that I firmly believe that on every page of the Bible, you can find at least the, the, the breadcrumb trail that would lead you to the truth of who Jesus is. <clears throat> and sometimes the presence of Christ in the Old Testament is through shadow and illusion, and sometimes it jumps out at you just so strongly that it's tough not to see that what is being described in the wisdom literature is actually a prefiguration of who Jesus was, the character of who he is, and what he's accomplished for us. And so I, I hate to, you know, in some ways I'm sort of opening the last chapter of the book for you already and telling you what the sermon is about, because each one of these sermons in some way is going to be about Jesus. The second thing is that for these sermons, at least, at least while I'm preaching, I'm, I'm taking sort of an open dialogue approach. So if at any point in time you have a question, you have a concern, you think I'm totally off base, you want to disagree with me, you want to add a point, raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can, you can pipe up. I don't see any reason that all sermons have to be just me talking wah, 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 and you listening, right, like quietly. Now I know for some of you that will be traumatizing. Because your parents made sure that you stayed quiet as a mouse during the sermon, right? And in order to say something, you will have to overcome that conditioning. But I guarantee you, your mother's not here for most of you, right? And that you are absolutely welcome to say whatever comes to mind. Um, and if, I, if you raise your hand, you don't call on you, it's either because I'm on a roll and I'm not sure how I'd get off that train track and get back on. Or because despite my new spiffy glasses, I still didn't see you. Does that make sense? So we're going to go to the 24th chapter of the book of Psalms, or Psalm 24. <clears throat> to give you a little bit of historical context behind this, one of the challenges with most of the wisdom literature is that there is not anything inside the text itself that tells you what the context of the psalm or the proverb is. Does that make sense? So if you go through and you look at any of the epistles, say you, you are reading through the book of Romans, well, you know the context because Paul will tell you the context. He will tell you who wrote it. He will tell you who it's written to. You have some sort of historical idea as to what was going on during that time because you can go back and do some study and find out exactly what was going on. In many instances, there are internal clues within the text itself that tell you what the context is, what the trouble is, why Paul is writing, etc. The challenge in interpreting the Psalms specifically is that we don't have any of those textual clues necessarily. But there are some hints in the text that will help us to understand what it is that David, who wrote most of the Psalms, was trying to get to, or what he was getting at. And in this particular Psalms, it seems to me, and it seems to others who have written commentaries, that what was going on is David was describing a time in which the Levitical priests were on their way up the mountain of God to the city of Jerusalem in order to place the Ark of the Covenant back, or at least maybe for the first time, in its resting place in Jerusalem in the tabernacle, or perhaps it may have been after the Philistines had captured the tabernacle that it was bring bought, bring bought back. To Jerusalem. <clears throat> and so it is a, what's called a psalm of ascent. A psalm where the people are going up in worship in order to bring themselves to the mountain of God. Where the Ark of the Covenant would rest. 
where the Shekinah glory of God would find his resting place among his people. Now, topographically, uh, Jerusalem is not like where I come from, Wyoming. I come from Wyoming, and so when we talk about hills, we mean hills, right? When I came out here and people were talking about hills and they would say, well, that's a hill. I'm like, no, that's, that's, like, that's like four rocks stacked on top of each other, <laughs> right? That's not a hill. That's the, this is a hill. This is not a hill, right? Where I come from, hills are steep. And, and this, these are not so steep. Well, Jerusalem is not exactly, su- it's not exactly like the Grand Teton Mountains where you have to go vertical in order to get up them. You can get up there just fine. And so sometimes when you're reading the Psalms, you might wonder, well, what's the big deal, right? I mean, it's a little elevated from the rest of the, of the plain around it, but it's not exactly, you know, it's not, it's not exactly like you have to hang a top rope and, and find different footholds to get up the mountain. However, if you're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, it's probably a little more daunting than you might think. Because that thing is heavy. If you see the way it's described in the Old Testament, at least I can imagine how many people holding on to this thing, praying for your dear life that they don't misstep. Because the one thing you don't want to do is accidentally touch the Ark of the Covenant in the wrong place, because then you're dead. And you don't want to drop the Ark of the Covenant, not only because that's, that probably will lead to a job opening when it comes to your position, but also because if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, it never works out for anybody. And so here they are climbing up the top of this hill, which is not particularly steep, and yet nevertheless it seems like somewhat of an arduous journey. It's in the context of this reality that I believe Psalm 24 is spoken from the mouth of David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it says, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand In his holy place, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation, such as the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. And be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Lift up your head, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory, the Lord of hosts? He is the King of glory. These words are the words of the Lord. Sometimes as you look through the Psalms, you wonder how some things maybe fit together. And at least in this particular Psalm, it appears that there's sort of three sections. And it's not, it's not intuitively obvious why these three sections work together, or what David is at. Every now and again, you kind of get the impression that maybe David sat down perhaps with a good cup of coffee. I don't know whether they had coffee at that point, and maybe some kind of a tea made out of figs. Who knows, right? I guess coffee, probably not. That's a blessing referred to, reserved for us today. And and, and he's he's, he's penning the part of Psalm 24, the beginning. His mind has been directed in the power of the Holy Spirit to think about creation, and then maybe he gets interrupted. And, And he spends maybe a whole day without having the opportunity to sit down and write, and then he comes back in his mind rather than is directed to this time in which the tabernacle was the destination and, and he was leading the procession of the Levites with the Ark of the Covenant to come in and then, and then he got interrupted again. And, then, and maybe he came back and he's thinking to himself, okay, now I'm thinking about this battle and how God showed himself faithful in battle and I'm thinking about the enemies that surround me and my mind is directed towards the reality that God is with us because he has called us as his people and so his, he thinks of God as the king of glory, the one who is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts, by the way, if you're not 
don't know, the Lord of hosts simply means the king of armies, the Lord of the one who has angel armies. And maybe that was the case. Who knows what happened, why David goes from creation to the trip to up the mountain to the hill of God to God, the one who sustains him in battle. But in many ways, whether it by, be by divine accident, if there is such a thing, or whether David sat and penned it all in one sitting, we don't know, but it certainly does help us to understand how all of those concepts come together in the person of Christ. All of them. In many ways, if you were to ask yourself the question of, is there a key, maybe a secret decoder ring to Psalm 24, I would ask um, that there is, but you would have to understand and know the person of Jesus Christ in order to understand and have that decoder ring. And the reason I say that is because each one of these aspects, these elements of the psalm point to a central portion, point to a characteristic of who Jesus is, gives us a clue to his identity. And the first one clues us into the reality that the identity of God as the creator is intrinsically and extricably wound together with the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19 makes this point clearly. <clears throat> when Paul says, speaking of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Now, like most Pauline passages, there's like 16 sermons in there, but I only have time to preach one, maybe two. That's a joke, by the way. I won't keep you that long. But there's one thing that is this absolutely revelatory, that we, because we, most of us who've grown up in some kind of a Christian background have been taught from an early age, and so it doesn't astound us like it would the first time that a Jewish person heard those words. See, as we direct our attention back to the world in which David wrote Psalm 24, there were essentially two kinds of individuals on the planet. There were a whole swath of individuals who all had some kind of creation myth. Most of them believed in some kind of pantheon, many different gods. What's, what's, what's really kind of interesting, I mean, it's not that interesting, but it's a little interesting, is that most of the other, well, not most, but many of the other creation myths see the creation of the world somewhat like an accident. It was like, like oops. I mean, you, you, you can go back and see many of the, the creation myths around them that sort of assumed that, that the gods didn't intend to create human humanity, and they were frustrated that it happened. So if you were a Greek at the time of the writing of Psalm 24 in this fledgling little place in Greece, perhaps, or maybe part of the Hittite Empire, maybe one of the individuals who was from the Canaanite group of people, you, you would have heard this idea that the God, of a- a- the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob created the world ex nihilo, that he spoke and the world came into being. And that he intentioned man for a specific purpose, and that purpose was to be his image bearer, to be made in the image of God. And you would have thought, that's ridiculous. Everybody knows that there are there are tens, if not hundreds of gods, and everybody knows that humanity and, and divinity are, they are roughly the same, that the gods aren't very much different than us. They're, 
they're fallible and they do dumb things and they are at war with each other and they have conflicts and they make silly mistakes. And that's the reason for all of these stories that we have. It would have been an absolute change of one's mindset, a revolution in the way that you saw the world, an absolute... To, to understand that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was one God who created all things, you would have had to have endured a revolutionary change in your mindset. You would have had to have thrown out everything that you had ever been taught in order to embrace this truth. And it absolutely is the truth. Well, at the time of the writing of Paul, to Paul even writing to those who were either Jews or Greeks, it would have been a revolutionary mindset for them to reconceptualize this God, this one God, that in many ways was nameless and faceless. And though he had names, they, they did not have a conception or understanding that God was a trinity. Not in its full. There are hints in the Old Testament. But not in its fullness. And so the New Testament gives us this glorious revelation of who God is as Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally existent for all eternity, as Father, Son, and Spirit. And then to hear that this carpenter's son, who was not only man, but also God, was the one who, who created all things in heaven and earth, invisible and invisible. Not only did he create all things, but everything was created through him. He was the agent of creation. Not only that, it was created for him. The entirety of the creation was designed to give him glory. That he was before all things, and in him all things hold together. Everything works the way it's supposed to work because of Jesus. Because of the second person of the Trinity, because of the Son of God. We all walk around in this world that is predictable. We take things for granted every day. Now let me give you just a few examples. How many of you are deathly afraid that tomorrow all of your molecules will just disassociate and you'll wake up as a puddle? Do you ever have that fear? Good, because that would be an irrational fear. You hold together because of physics and because of biological rules that all depend upon the person of Jesus Christ, that the way that you are today will be the way that you are tomorrow. Anybody have an irrational fear that tomorrow gravity will just stop and will just float off the planet? That, that you wish. <laughs> It might make things a little easier for some people, yeah. No, but the, the, the reality of that is, look, we, we, we wake up in the morning, we, we believe that gravity is going to function the same way as it does to tomorrow as it does today, that our cells are going to hold together, right, that your eyes are going to be in the same place, like tomorrow your eyes aren't going to show up and be on the back of your head. It's not going to happen. Why? Well, there's all sorts of scientific and mathematical reasons for that, but it all comes down to a very philosophical basic premise which is that the reason that everything spins like it should and we are contiguous like we ought to be and that gravity is consistent like it always has been for the entirety of our life, the reason that the speed of life, light is somewhat constant, right, that inertia works is because Jesus intended it that way and he keeps it that way. Everything continues to hold together in him. And so whether Jew or Greek, you had a Jewish group of people who were like, God is one, and we believe that he's one, and he created all things. And they were absolutely right. They were completely right compared to the Gentile world surrounding them that thought that the world was maybe an accident or some, just some result of, of these warring, crazy, jealous, uh, disputing gods. Uh, but, but even to the Jewish population to understand that, that God had condescended to join himself to a human nature and that in that human person, the person of Jesus Christ, was also the full image of God, the firstborn of all creation, the one in whom full divinity dwelled, that everything was created by him and through him and for him and everything held together because of him. 
And you would have had to discard a whole set of what the rabbis had told you in order to embrace that. But we see a glimpse of it in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he, who? Who is he? Not some nameless, faceless God. For he, the Son of God, in concert with the work of the Father and the Spirit, has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the river. And now it all starts to make a little sense when you ask that question, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Maybe the same one who created all things is the one who is the most qualified to ascend the hill of the Lord. From the identity of God as creator, we begin to ask ourselves questions about the identity of the one who ascends the hill of the Lord. Now to understand that, you need to understand the priestly role a bit. The tabernacle was created as a means of God providing his Shekinah glory in the midst of the presence of his people whom he rescued from the hands of Egyptians in the Exodus. And so if you remember that story, you know that God led his people through a pillar of cloud by night and a pillar of, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that represented the very protection that he had for his people. And then he instructed his people to build a tabernacle, essentially a mobile temple. And the Shekinah glory of God, the very power of God, came to rest in the midst of the holy place in that temple. And God anointed Moses as the prophet, but Aaron as the priest. And Aaron, Moses' brother, his children, the line of Levites, would be the only ones who could serve in the inner part of the temple. So the temple was made up of different courts. And if you're a Gentile like me, you're just out of luck. You're not getting anywhere near that thing. And then there was the temple court where Jewish people could come. And then there was the court of men. So if you're a woman, you're out of luck. You're not getting any closer than that. There's a court of men. And there was a court of Levites. So unless you weren't a Levite and a priest, you weren't getting any closer. And there, there was the inner place where the Ark of the Covenant rested, and that was sequestered and separated from the people of God and from all of humanity except for one person who went in once a year. And if you've heard me preach in your sermons, you've heard me give this illustration a hundred times, if not more. The chief priest, the one who was anointed to go in once a year during the Day of Atonement, would go in after having making purifications for himself and for the people, and he would do his thing in the inner sanctum of the temple, and then he would leave. And they would tie a rope with a bell around him. And the bell signified he's still alive, and he didn't make any mistakes. And if the bell quit ringing, that meant that there was an opening, a job opening for chief priest. Because he had offended the holiness of God, and they had to pull him out dead by the rope. He, 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 would, he, he, he would make atonement for the people. And so he would bring the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the horns um, of, the, of the, 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 um, the Ark of the Covenant. Very good question. But what did he have to do? What did he do to get pulled out by a rope? Oh, there were people. And there were people in, in the, the, the other Levites, right? I mean, it, it's sort of like, it, it, it's kind of a morbid job to be the guy who's holding on to the rope, Right. Because if, that, if the bell quits ringing and you keep tugging and nobody tugs back, right, um, the, <laughs> your job was to pull the dead guy out from the other side of the curtain so that you didn't go in. Because if you went in, you weren't anointed as the chief priest, and now, now you have two dead Levites in the, in, in the Holy of Holies. It's a real problem, right? One of them doesn't have a rope. Now what are you going to do? So all of this was... <laughs> Who, 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 had a, who, had a comment, who had a comment? Was it a joke? Was it a good one? Oh, it's you groaned. <laughs> yes, well, it, it, is, it was a little complicated. So, so the question is, so why, why, all this, why all this separation? Like, what's with the separation? Doesn't God want to be close to us? Like, like what, what's, what's God's deal that he wants women only to come this far and then after men? I mean, goodness gracious. 
It is, it, right? You get, all, you, get, you get canceled today. Your Twitter account is automatically frozen if you make that kind of a comment today, right? What, what's with that? And beyond that, it's like, if, if, if you're offended, ladies, I can certainly understand, because I don't even get to go near. It's like Gentiles, you're just, you're, sorry, you're totally out of luck. Ladies, you're a little less out of luck. Men, you still get to go a little closer, but mostly out of luck. Levites, you're pretty good. One dude, once a year, is lucky enough to go in, and if he doesn't do it perfectly, he dies. What's with all that? And I think the answer comes in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. So if you want to turn with me, go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Starting in the first verse says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. That was the Holy of Holies. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak in detail even though Judy wants to know. (laughs) Just joking. These preparations have thus been made. The priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. But into the second only, the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the holy indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing which is symbolic for the present age. According to the arrangement of gifts and sacrifices and offerings, that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but only deal with food and drink and various washing regulations for the body imposed until the time of the Reformation. And so my interpretation of what that verse says is there is all of these regulations in the Old Testament. They were very complicated, and in many ways, they were intentioned to illustrate and to highlight the separation between God and man. It was designed to show you that you should only go so far and no closer. Why? Well, because the the sacrifices that were intended to make, that they were commanded to make, could only do so much. They could never truly cleanse the conscience of those who participated. Well, the Catholic Church does believe in many respects uh, that especially during the Eucharist that it's a re-offering of the blood and body of Jesus Christ. It does. And that's why I'm not Catholic, right? Love my Catholic brothers and sisters, but there's a point of theology upon which I very much disagree. Because all these regulations, it says, were imposed until. That's a big until. If you're the kind of person that underlines and highlights your Bible, I'm not. But if you are... Uh, highlight and underline the until, until the time of Reformation. But, in verse 11, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing and eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of a defiled person with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, say that ten times fast, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, if you were to ask that question and you were to really reflect upon it, you're going to realize that along the way, lots of people are going to to be able to go so far when they're ascending the hill of the Lord. And who shall stand in his holy place? Well, if you're talking about me, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And we're thinking about the old covenant, I can't go. 
And most of you can only go so far. Actually, most of you can't go either. And there's only one, Nikki, probably, who has a, a, a genuine, legitimate claim to being mostly Jewish, right? She can't even go as far as the guys. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Well, not very many people. And who shall stand in his holy place? Fewer still. And who can go into the Holy of Holies? Only one guy. And then, verse 4, he has to have clean hands, a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, like none of us has ever done any of that stuff. Right? Man. So, I mean, even David couldn't go so far up the hill of the Lord. For he just had to stop Stop going. Until the time of the Reformation. Until the coming of Jesus. Who entered the temple, not the temple here on earth, but for that's just a mere copy of the one that represents the trueness of what will take place in the midst of God. Who offered himself and was crucified on a cross on a hill. See, you see, Jesus' trip up a hill was a little rougher. He didn't have to carry the Ark of the Covenant because in many ways he was the Ark of the Covenant. And instead of arriving at the top of the hill in order to be greeted by grandeur and by pomp and circumstance and by the accolades and approval of the people, he was despised and rejected of all men. The Bible says he came to those who were his own, but his own did not receive him. But then he said to as many as received him, he gave the power to be called sons and daughters of God. Who shall shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Yeah, I wonder if that hill might not have also foreshadowed the hill that Jesus went up. Who had clean hands, a pure heart, who'd never lifted up his soul to what is fault and never swore deceitfully. And because he went up, we can too. We can too. I don't know if you've ever done any mountain climbing, but during my high school days, um, actually junior high days in the summer, we had a small Boy Scout troop and went to climb up a mountain. And we got lost halfway up the trail, and so we're, we're, we went off trail, and we're just traipsing up the side of the mountain trying to find our way to the very top. And when we got to the top, the goal was if we'd spend a few minutes, we'd have some lunch, you know, we'd enjoy each other's company, and then we'd start back down. And but it, it's not that we're not talking like, I'm not talking like the Himalayas here. It's, it's, it's Colorado. It's not, you know, it's very doable. Well, despite the fact, you know, we, we, we were dirty, we were tired, we were gross, and everyone had fallen five or six times, and our hands were cut up and bloodied and dirtied from, from constantly falling and reaching out in front of us. And, you know, all sorts of matter of junk was on our hands. And we, 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 we all thought, how are we going to eat lunch? Because, you know, it's not like they're cooking a, f- a five-course dinner and helicoptering the thing in there. Uh, it's, it's bologna sandwiches. We had some cold cuts that were on ice. We're bringing them up to the top of the mountain. You're going to have to eat with your hands. We're looking at your hands. We're like, that's going to be disgusting. How are we going to get our hands clean when we get to the top of the mountain? How are we going to have anything to drink when you get to the top of the mountain? There are no faucets up there. There was a trail, and they had little places where you could get water, but you get up above tree line, and you're just not going to get any water. There just isn't any available up there. We got up to the top of the mountain, and we realized that our Boy Scout leader, probably once every day for four days we'd been going up there, had hauled up, before we had ever been up, water to the top of the mountain, so that when we got there, there was water that we could use to wash our hands and to drink with, and we enjoyed our bologna sandwiches, and we thought it was a great thing. And that's what Jesus did for you. You're not getting to the top of the mountain with clean hands, not you. Not me either. 
how, how pompous do we have to, believe, to be to think that when the Bible talks about the people who have clean hands, that it's us? But do we have to forget what we're like in order to do that? It's, it's, there's, this, there's this toxic and pathological way that we often read the Bible. When we read the heroes of the Bible, we automatically assert our name into those places. And it's entirely possible, in fact, mostly likely, that when we read the stories of the Bible, that we're not David, we're Goliath. We're not the people of God, we're the Philistines. We're not the friends of God, we're the enemies of God. We're not the ones who have clean hands, we're the ones whose hands are really dirty, and somebody's going to have to come and clean them up for us, or we're not making it up the hill of the mountain of the Lord. And that's the only way the gospel starts to make any sense. See, you place yourself in the person of the one who's climbing up there. You're like, oh, I'm one of the good guys. Of course I am, because it's me, right? Then every now and again, you stop, start wondering, well, what is that for then? I mean, why did that have to happen? We're the good guys. Jesus doesn't have to die for good guys. No, maybe Jesus is the one with clean hands and a pure heart. <clears throat> maybe he's the one who never lifted up his soul to what is false. I know I have. Maybe he's the only one who had no deceit in his mouth. I know I have. Man, I remember a time in my life when I would lie about lying and I'd have to tell another lie to cover up the first two lies. Ever happened to you? Twice. <laughs> Good. Maybe three times just, through it, just now then. Yeah. But here's what is true of us. For those of us who've come to the place in our life in which we've placed our trust in Christ, we will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of our salvation. James refers to this passage in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, when he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder, you covet, and it cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. <clears throat> Here's James trying to make friends now. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns zealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? And now it's time for some good news, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. See, I, I'm not, I'm con a lot of people read James and, and they come to this conclusion that James had like literally no sense of humor, right? But I don't think that's what that passage means. I think she's like, if you think it's funny before you come to Christ, nothing's funny. If you think it's funny while you're still in your sin, it ain't funny. If you want to know what real joy and genuine laughter that comes from a belly full of joy comes from, you have to first... Humble yourself, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, knowing that he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And that's how you get your hands clean and your heart purified. You want to know how you get up the, hand, uh, up the mountain with clean hands and a pure heart? That's how. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Man, the Bible says he's already drawn near to you. 
He's drawn nearer than you could ever imagine. See, the Old, Te- Old Testament sets up this temple system with a great deal of separation. But Jesus goes into that temple and he breaks down the wall, that curtain that separates you from I, so that we can be one with God, so that we don't have to see God as some nameless, faceless person who sits in eternity far, far away, who looks down upon the creation that he has made with eyes of disdain and judgment. And that's how most people see God. You know what's, what's just fabulous? Is if you look at the way that the Old Testament views God, they talk about him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They talk about it according to his, his attributes, his mightiness or his gloriousness. But there's one thing that predominates the way that the New Testament describes God. There's one word that is unique to the New Testament that is almost never mentioned in the Old Testament to describe God. You want to know what that word is? It's Father. Jesus revealed to you in Christ that God is your Father. Not some nameless, faceless, amorphous person in some place far, far away who is so holy that he looks down upon you with eyes of disdain because of your sinfulness. No, God looks at you through this role that he has disclosed to you in the person of Jesus Christ. You are his child and he is your Father if you know his Son, Jesus Christ. You don't get up the mountain with clean hands because you deserve to have a clean hands. You stumbled up just like the rest of us. It's just that Jesus went up first. And when you got to the top, he's like, let my blood cleanse your hands and your conscience. Just draw near to me. And I'll draw near to you. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. The identity of God as creator is paramount. The identity of the one who ascends the hill in the Lord is prototypical of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we draw near to him, we receive the blessings that we are given that are foretold in the book of Isaiah. Let me give you a couple of examples. Isaiah 55, 6 through 9 says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Verse 6, it says in, verse 20, in, in Psalm 24, it says, Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Well, how do you do that? Isaiah 55, 6, 9 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Now, I, I can't tell you how many times that I have preached the next few verses. Wrong. And so, sorry. I don't know how many times I have quoted, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are from the earth, for my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I think there's at least probably two, if not three, sermons in which I've totally bungled it. Mea culpa. Because to me, that just sounds like some nameless, faceless God who is far away and who doesn't think like we do because he can't possibly identify with us. Because he's just so holy and just so far away that my thoughts could not possibly be a reflection of his thoughts. And while that's true, I mean, I got, I got 3.5 pounds of, of brain matter at the top of my head. There's no way I'm going to be able to think like God, right? And, and for those people who believe that they can figure God out, what hubris. I mean, God's infinite. He's not even bound by your physicality. And yet you, who use maybe 3 to 5% of the gray matter that's sitting on top of your head, you feel like you should be able to figure God out? Okay. Let me know how that works. But that's not really what the verse is talking about because the preceding part of it talks about how when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. That when we seek the face of the God of Jacob, that he is near to us, that he pardons us, that he forgives us. That's what it's about. See, when we get offended, we do this. We push people away. That's our way. When people hurt our feelings, we want to get back at them, don't we? That's our thoughts. But 
But that's not his way. And those aren't his thoughts. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. See, if there's anything that you get from this sermon, I hope that maybe, just possibly, your vision of God as this <clears throat> nameless, faceless, eternal being that rests in some place so far, far away who looks down upon humanity with crossed arms, with disapproving judgment, will be challenged. And that you'll begin to see God for who Jesus revealed him to be. Which is a God who is willing to send his only son to climb a mountain with clean hands to stretch them out on a cross and to bleed and die in order that you and I might become sons and daughters of God that don't have to be afraid of our father but can just simply run into his lap and said, I'm sorry, I blew it again. And to begin to see God as one who will abundantly pardon because he's not like you. He's better. Isaiah 61, 10 through 11, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in him, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprout and the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spread out from all the nations. See, that's what God does. He clothes us. He clothes us with righteousness. When we come to him, he just places that robe of mercy upon us. He clothes us with the very righteousness of Christ. Not because we deserve it. But because he loves us. Well, then David goes in from Psalm 24, talking about the one who ascends the mountain to the king of glory. Verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. As if the temple itself is inviting Christ in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts, for he is the king of glory. Who who is this who is being invited in into the midst of the people of God? Well, in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, we see this vision that Paul was given on the island of Patmos. If you read through the book of Revelation, you'll just get, if you read through it in one sitting, you'll just get a headache. It's, 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 there's so much going on. You get to Revelation 19, you're ready for a lot of good news. And then in Revelation chap, chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, we read this. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a rope dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and purple, will following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, 
with which he strikes down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury, the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lord. Who is the King of Glory? Well, Jesus reveals through John that it's him. Jesus is the King of Glory. Who is the Lord of Hosts? Who is the Lord of Armies? Well, that's Jesus's. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Jesus is the one who commands thousands of angels in the heavenlies, and when he comes back, he brings them with him. And that leads me to the conclusion. Almost five minutes early. And it's a pretty simple one. Because you either know God as Father, as Redeemer, as Comforter, as Savior, as Lord, or you know Him as enemy. And there's no middle ground. See, we often look at God and we think of God and before we come to know Him as the, in the person of Jesus Christ as a nameless, faceless being who is far, far away, who looks down upon His creation with a sense of disapproval and judgment. And then when we come to a place in our life in which we genuinely trust in Jesus Christ, we begin to know Him as Father. And we come to see ourselves as His children. But those who would oppose God, who would look upon the cross of Christ, who would see Jesus and who would reject him, they have become those people who look disapprovingly and down their nose on a God who humbled himself to the point of taking a cross upon his back to bleed and die and tell him, it's not good enough and I don't want you. And they will know God as judge. And there are only two choices. You either keep stumbling up the mountain and get to the top and realize that someone has already brought the water up so that you can wash your hands. Or you keep stumbling up to the top of the mountain and when you finally get to the cross, you look up at the one who bleeds and dies for you and you say, I don't want it and I don't care. And listen, if that's you, I get it. I did it for years. I did it for years. But then some pastor preached some sermon reminded me that there was a God who desperately wanted me to fall on my knees and to raise up my hands and to say, God, I want to know you. And I know there's things I need to be forgiven of. And I'm tired, I'm so tired of walking through this world alone. And I want to follow you as a teacher and call you my Lord. And I believe in the resurrection of your son Jesus from the dead. And I want to be your child. And I pray that God gives you the grace that from the depths of your heart you'll say that one day. And maybe it's today. Can we pray together? Father in heaven, I pray for 
all of us, Lord God, that we would be reminded of the grace that we stand in. Jesus is the one who created us. He is the one who sustains us. It's in him that everything that we are continues to hold together. He is the one that loves this world enough to keep it all running. Father, help our hearts to be reminded that he is the one who went up the the mountain. He is the one who ascended to your hill, Lord. And through his sacrifice, we find the redemption that can be found through the forgiveness of sins and through this healing of our hearts for we were always created to be in fellowship with you. Lord God, through Psalm 24, we remind ourselves of the fact that he's coming again. And for those of us who await his return, we simply await with humility and with thanksgiving in our hearts, knowing that if your son is for us, then who can be against us? God, I pray that all of those in this room who have given their life to Christ will walk out of this room knowing that the God of angel armies is behind them and beside them and leads them out so that when they hit the floor on Monday running to do whatever it is that you've called them to do, they know that your power is within them. And I pray for those in this room who may not yet have come to that place in which they've surrendered to you. And God, would you give them the grace today to do it? And if that's you, you can pray that that prayer too. It's not about the words of the prayer. It's just about your heart. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or do jumping jacks or come forward or sign a card. None of that. This is between you and God. And maybe it's time for you to say, God, I'm tired of doing this alone. And I know there's things I've done that I need to be forgiven of. So I thank you for the forgiveness that comes from the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I want to learn from you and call you Lord. I don't want to be your child. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing song, Be Thou My Vision.
Listen, one of the things I despise probably the most is this whole commercialization of evangelical Christianity and the fact that sometimes when you watch Christian television, they look more like used car salesmen than they do like people. Um, so I want to be, do everything I can to not be like that. But I do want to let you know, listen, if you've prayed that prayer or you just have questions or you want some guidance, man, get a hold of me. There's nothing I like better than to sit down over a cup of coffee and to discuss what it means to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Does that make sense? And if you pray that prayer today, would you just reach out to me? You can come talk to me after the service. You can get hold of us through the church. Just want to have a chance to help you to take your first steps in Christ because I was so grateful for the people who came alongside me when I prayed that prayer. Can we pray together? Father in heaven, I thank you so much for these people. Lord God, will you go before them and beside them and behind them, for you are the God of angel armies. Will you remind them this day that you ascended that hill for them, that when they get to the top of the hill, they may cleanse their hands by faith through grace because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And may they go with a confidence in knowing that you call them Father. They, they, call you, they call you Father, that you have called them your children, that you will never leave them nor your forsake them, and you look upon them through the eyes of the righteousness of Christ. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you want to give to the ongoing work of our church, there's a box in the back. We'll see you next week, and we love you.